So good afternoon. As you will uh, notice, the main difference between natural scientists and social scientists is that they use ropes and we use paper. <laughs> so it is my pleasure to, uh, to introduce Professor Shatima Threadcraft. Uh, she's a political scientist uh, who has just been recruited at the in the Department of Government at Dartmouth College. Uh, she was previously in the Department of Women's and Gender Studies at Rutgers. Uh, she has a PhD uh, in political theory um, at Yale University. And her first book, Intimate Justice, The Black Female Body and the Body Politic, addresses the blind spot of women and gender in contemporary theories of racial justice focusing in particular on forced sterilizations and the control over the sexual and reproductive life of African-American women, which she traces back to the time of slavery. It received, among other distinctions, the American Political Science Association's prize for the best book on race, ethnicity, and politics, and the National Women's Studies Association Award for the best book on women and labor. In the continuation of this earlier uh, work, a current project, of which he will present some aspects today, examines the way in which the death of black men in the hands of the police has been displayed and debated in the media and by activists, and how this necropolitics, as we can call it, obscures once more the gender dimension of racial inequality in the United States. Okay, so feminists have long reflected on how so uh, societies think about the human body, uh, the relationship between the body and politics, and the impact of both on the standing of women in these societies. So they have, for example, called attention to ancient views of the body that went on to become part of the Christian tradition, where the body was seen as the prison of the soul and the thing that often kept the soul from achieving goodness. So in a context that tended to hold the body in contempt and suspicion, they pointed out that thinkers like Plato uh, said that to demonstrate too much concern for the body was to, quote, act like a woman. So they've also considered phenomenological accounts of the body, which understand the body as the mind's tool. And here, Iris Marion Young writes of how cultural expectations that, um, that hold that women should primarily display their bodies as objects of the male gaze keeps women from using their bodies as such a tool. So she goes on to speak of what she calls feminine motion, to throw like a girl, for example, where only part of the female body moves and the rest remains motionless. On this view, women are quite literally handicapped by patriarchy. Now the list goes on, as do the fascinating insights of feminist inquiry. Today, however, I think that the most important issue uh, for feminists regarding the relationship between the body and politics is a focus among a prominent group of activists on how our society produces dead black bodies. Now, the black body that has received the most attention in US racial politics since the Ferguson protests in August of 2014 is a deceased one. And here, contemporary racial politics has of late been focused on the politics of death and on the important related work of exposing police efforts to ensure um, citizens that it has produced the quote, right kind of dead, a violent thug, for example. Now, in practice, this has meant that the body around which activists can most easily rally adherence to the cause of racial justice is a deceased one, and I would add, a body that has been rendered deceased in spectacular fashion. Now, it's important to remember that this is not the first time in U.S. history that blacks have rallied around the bodies of the dead and around the spectacle of black death. So another important instance is the U.S. anti-lynching movement in the late uh, 19th and 20th centuries. Um, and in fact, there are many similarities in how activists in both eras attempted to intervene in the politics of death and, or attempted to change a political order that all too often produced dead bodies. Now, one similarity is in how activists have challenged the meanings assigned to the bodies of the black dead. Now, the Black Lives Matter campaign challenged officials' efforts to attach the meaning thug to the bodies of the black slain, uh, black slain by police much as the famous anti-lynching activist Ida B. Wells challenged efforts to mark all lynching victims as rapists. Both eras activists understood the work that those words do, that is thug and rapist, and how they both function to justify death. Activists in both eras also employ the use of iconography and the rhetoric of interchangeability. So this suggestion of interchangeability 
that any lynching victim could have been me, that any uh, victim of police violence could have been me, has, has been an effective strategy and an extremely effective way to use the bodies of the dead to rally adherence to a cause. So much as a generation of blacks saw themselves in Emmett Till's lynch body, I am very often encouraged to see myself in any photo of Michael Brown. And perhaps you've seen uh, Trayvon Martin hoodies and people that and heard people say that I am Trayvon and we are all Trayvon. Now the strategic response to um, contemporary lethal police violence has been impressive, but like absolutely everything, it's not without its problems. As the Black Lives Matter campaign captured the nation's attention, I argued that it was crucial to the, for those concerned with the status of women in society to consider how a spectacular death-centered politics might marginalize the concerns of black women. Now, it's, it might tend to do so because women are far less likely to be killed than men, and they are much uh, less likely to be killed in so-called spectacular fashion. So for example, of the 4,000 plus blacks lynched between 1880 and 1930, only 200 were women, and many female lynching victims were never suspected of any crime. They were instead, they died in the place of a male target, such as a husband, father, or brother. Today, only about one in 10 blacks are uh, killed by the police are women. And when black women uh, come into problematic contact with police, they are far more likely to be sexually assaulted or extorted for sex in exchange for leniency than to be killed. Now, many black women are murdered, however. They just tend to be murdered without this all-important spectacle. So much of the absence of spectacle for black women is connected to differences in how men and women die, or you might say the differences between homicide and femicide. So first of all, men are more likely to be killed, although it's important to note that uh, black women are much more likely to be killed than white men in the United States. But men are more likely to be killed in public, on the street, at a bar, or a sporting event, and this is because men are more likely to be in these places. Men are also more likely to be killed during concurrent illegal activity, uh, criminal activity, and in this broader context, men are also more likely to be killed by police, and now they are more likely to be killed by police on tape. Women, on the other hand, are far less likely to be killed in general, though again, black women are the likeliest among this group to be killed. When women are killed, they are killed in private, by intimate partners, or in sex-related murders. So black women, for complex reasons, are three times more likely to die at the hands of a current or ex-partner, and with X being an important category as leaving a partner is often a key precipitating event for lethal violence. In fact, while it is alarmingly true that a black man is killed by a policeman, security agent, security guard, or other similar agent every 24 hour, 28 hours in the United States, it is also true that every 21 hours a black woman is killed by an intimate partner. And I call attention to the above, that is both to police sexual misconduct and to lethal intimate partner violence to point out that a spectacular death-centered politics does not serve black women well. Now, that black women suffer from what I call this spectacular death deficit presents a problem today, as this spectacle of public death, where technology facilitates the process of multiplying witness, so now all can see and no longer deny lethal police violence. This has been invaluable to the Black Lives Matter campaign, much as the lynch black male body um, and the reproduced images of that lynch body were invaluable to early 20th century black politics and even to the construction of black peoplehood. So in fact, throughout the late 19th, the 20th, and now even in the 20, 21st century, from anti-lynching activism to 1960s uprisings which, or riots, which often began in response to an incident of police brutality, to contemporary activism, nothing has mobilized blacks quite like spectacular death. And think of all that is still evoked regarding American history and racial politics in the simple stark image of a noose. Now contemporary activists well know this and frequently compare lethal police violence to lynching. And critically, it is this idea of the ever present imminent risk of death, of violent spectacular death at the hands of white people that has helped to forge blacks as a people in this country, leading I think to a trouble status for women among those very people. Think of what it means um, that all black bodies are not equally evoked by this all-important symbol of racial oppression, the noose. What then are those who would ameliorate the conditions of black women in society to do? So now what are spectacular death deficient black women left with in the absence of these rallying spectacles? And a few things I think, but I will leave you to ponder too. So first, anti-violence against women activists have had some success 
in pointing out that we should emphasize the domestic in domestic terrorism as many perpetrators of mass violence practice on the women and children in their lives first. These activists have had success in convincing others that private violence very often goes public, that private terrorism eventually becomes what we think of as terrorism full stop. So therefore, it is worth devoting resources to the problem. And second, I think in a testament to how beneficial it is to think with others here at the Institute, fellow member Charlie Coleman, as well as academic assistant Munira Bush Bishop, sorry, both encouraged me to reflect on the recent success of the Me Too campaign. So you might recall the New York Magazine cover featuring 35 of Bill Cosby's accusers and the empty chair for the woman, the women who had not yet come forward. So sometimes the dam breaks and there's an avalanche. Um, but the, there are the overwhelming numbers of anonymous women who are victims of sexual harassment and sexual violence that were once private, open secrets, only spoken of in hushed tones, can be made into a spectacle itself when conditions are right. And I think that this is helpful, and I look forward to thinking more about this in the coming years. Thank you. So question and comments? I'm wondering about the death of women, and especially black women, uh, not in a, uh, in a public spectacle manner, but in the private uh, uh, arena of denied medical care yeah. and reproductive rights and all of these new statistics that are coming out with regard to maternal death and that sort of thing. That seems like an, another whole broad spectrum of black female death. Yes, so you were thinking about the recent New York Times article about uh, the greater risk of Fetal, maternal and fetal death among black women. Uh, absolutely, and I think that it is uh, connected to this work that I'm doing and a little bit more connected to the first book project I did because it was uh, much more about um, reproductive rights, but it is a connection that I didn't make between the two. And, you know, not to, I guess, stereotypically connect, you know, masculinity and maleness with this facing death and, women, and put women in a category of being about life and birth and things like that, but I do think that they have a lot in common and I, I, I do want to think about that going forward. Thank you. It is uh, remarkable that the United States, which has the highest by far level of expenses uh, for health, twice as much as the second country in the world, uh, is ranked uh, 55, I think, uh, 55th uh, in terms of maternal mortality worldwide, which is the level of uh, countries like Armenia or Algeria. Or and, and this is uh, also, uh, this discrepancy shows that not only the health system is very unequal uh, or unequally accessible in the United States, but it, it's al it also speaks to the fact that m much of maternal mortality, which is a topic on which I worked uh, some years ago, but uh, not in this country, um, uh, is not due directly to uh, to healthcare or lack of healthcare, uh, but to the uh, social, uh, the living condition of, of these women more generally. So the two elements play a very important role, living conditions uh, and uh, healthcare. I'm curious about the numbers for domestic violence mm -hmm. and how researchers get them. And given we're talking about public violence and private violence, mm -hmm. whether you think the numbers are accurate or there's a lot there that's not measured because it's private and behind closed doors. Um, yeah, well, I think uh, all activists say that these are undercounts, most likely. The, the stat from the black women being three times more likely to die is from the Violence Policy Center. And uh, the statistics around death are from the US Department of Justice. So, I mean, you can take uh, that and their decisions around counting that. In, yeah, I would Im imagine. What is your assessment? My sense is it's an undercount. Could you comment on genital mutilation and the way in which that's trending? I, 
have anything to say about Benny Hill? Did you? Do you I do not. <laughs> well, <coughs> there's uh, uh, the, the, the trend uh, is uh, that in many countries, uh, not so much due to international campaigns, although they play a role, but much more due to uh, the local activism of uh, women organizations from the countries where these uh, 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 female circumcision or mutilation uh, uh, occur, um, there's, uh, there has been a, a decrease in many, uh, many of, these, uh, of these countries, but that remains in some of them uh, a, a huge concern, both uh, in terms of uh, public health, but of course also in terms of women's rights. Um, I understand that uh, in Argentina at the moment, a, a lot of women are being killed by their partners. Yes. I think this is, is true news. Uh, I think I believe they call it femicide or something. Now, the the um, percent of uh, the proportion of Africans in Argentina is extremely low. Yeah. So, if you is there any. Uh, any similarity between what's going on there? Do you know anything about this w and what's happening I mean, in the US? So, so I don't know, so I know, you know, historically why there are very few Africans in Argentina in that they were, I mean, I, I wouldn't call it genocide, but there was a historical sort of get, getting rid of them. Um, but I think that broadly the, you know, it is the feminist bromide that the most sort of the critique of a liberal understanding of where danger comes from in society to understand that the most important source of danger and violence in a woman's life is most often not the state, it is in the family. And so the, um, when you say the term, or the use of the term femicide is to refer to death, the death of women, the murder of women because they are women and so it being connected to intimate partner violence would make it broadly similar with how women die around the world. So just to, to uh, a, a small complement to, to that answer, uh, first of all, what uh, Shatima has described is a worldwide phenomenon. It's not specific to the United States, it's not specific to Argentin Argentina, it's, it's, it could be uh, Argentina, it could be uh, uh, described uh, uh, all, over, all over the world. Uh, and and the important thing also, uh, she insisted very much uh, because that the topic and the racial justice that she's studying and the fact that she wanted to show what was obscured by the display of black death, uh, black death of men uh, as opposed to black, uh, the death of black women. Uh, but it, it doesn't mean that uh, the violence against women is limited to, s to minorities or limited to uh, the most disadvantaged social classes. All studies uh, that have been done uh, at the level of a whole society show that, and that's the case in France, for instance, show that you find this violence and sometimes this lethal violence in all social classes, in including in the elite, although it's less uh, visible very often, it's more hidden, uh, and second, that you find it in the uh, majority population as well uh, among the minorities. So, a slightly similar question in, in the sense of, of looking for generalization. I wonder if, if there's a parallel that can be drawn between, so the, the spectacular deaths that you were talking about with uh, the police killings that have been going of late and, uh, and other sorts of, of sectarian mob rule that, that pop up around the world. I was reading just yesterday, I think it was I think it was in Sri Lanka where Buddhists were 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 killing Muslims for mm -hmm. one reason or another, and then there's a there's typically at the at the the burial of the of the yeah. person who's been killed there is an an uproar. Is there a parallel to be drawn there? I mean, I think so. I, I mean, I would think about uh, funerals as a source of uh, you know eventually in the apartheid state they they sort of banned funerals because they became these important sources of people gathering together mourning and led to greater activism so in the sense that it is something that you can rally around and it's a you know death by an other in a very sort of easily um, understood other right so muslim buddhist right black white 
becomes a very clean sort of rallying point in a way that intra-racial violence against women is a lot more messy. And, but yeah, I would think there were broad similarities specifically in the us and them, the ability of them. The, the case of uh, South Asia is of course uh, very important to, to bring into the picture. Mm. First of all, because it's the region in the world where you have less uh, little girls than little boys, which uh, normally uh, the natural trend, uh, if there's no uh, human intervention, uh, is that uh, there's a slightly higher number of uh, boys being born than, uh, than girls. And so you have, the, uh, of course, the same situation in India, but, but the, because of neglect or even active uh, infanticide, uh, there's an Im elimination of, uh, uh, of girls, something that you see also in, in, uh, in China. And the other element uh, is for adult women, women uh, they have been in, uh, uh, in the conflicts, uh, including religious conflict, uh, the ones you mentioned, uh, and that was the case at the moment of the partition of, uh, of uh, Pakistan and the birth of uh, Bangladesh. But that has been uh, again the case in the killings of Muslims by uh, by Hindus, for example. Uh, women are especially a target, and they are target uh, not just by being killed, by, by but but by being raped. And this is a topic on which our uh, trustee Vina Das, uh, the anthropologist at uh, Johns Hopkins University, has uh, dedicated her a, a good part of her work. Could you say something about the role of the media, in particular social media and our kind of uh, visual culture? How does that change this whole discussion? Yes. Um, so what? So I see the I see a parallel in the project by Ida B. Wells. Sort of. So Ida B. Wells in the 19th and 20th century was writing back against the media that was sort of uh, helping lynching helping to both justify and also sort of sh making lynchings happen. And I think the, what people have done on social media, so Twitter has kind of, and black Twitter specifically, uh, as it's called, has democratized sort of the, the roots of people to get their stories out there. So the mainstream press reports on Twitter and the things that trend on Twitter and a phenomenon that people started to uh, acknowledge around 2010, 2012, was that um, black uh, communities in the United States, tightly networked uh, communities of blacks on Twitter, were able to drive the trending topics on Twitter throughout the world. So they, uh, newspapers, mainstream, the mainstream press got beat writers on what people were talking about on Twitter. So hashtags, social media hashtags, like if they gun me down, um, which took um, different photos of people in sort of street clothes and more stereotypically African-American youth attire versus um, people in their army uniforms or how they would go to work. And they asked the question, it was hashtag if they gun me down, what photo would the media use of me, right? And so they sort of, and they have long since, I mean, this started with Hurricane Katrina and the two photos side by side of the white family foraging for food and the black family looting and this sort of understanding of how differences in how the press were depicting black people um, created some of the problem. And so this critique of, so what social media has allowed, um, and they've been important since Trayvon Martin, I would say he sort of is a watershed in that, it has allowed people to sort of speak back to how to, to press, mainstream press depiction. Thank you. I'm wondering about the ways in which um, discussion of the spectacular deaths has um, helped the discussion of those that are not spectacular. And I'm thinking about um, this morning reading in The Guardian um, about the museum that just opened, the yes. Lincoln Museum. Um, the images that were published, uh, I think, given, given what you've stated about the stats about women versus men being uh, lynched, mm -hmm. the images published seem to show an equal number of women Is that right? um, to men. And, and I'm, I'm assuming that was conscious, um, if not to represent uh, the realities of lynching, at the very least to 
uh, demonstrate that it wasn't simply a, a, a gendered male um, phenomenon. Mm. I'm wondering if there are ways in which um, the, the spectacular has been incredibly productive in the discussion, or if that's possible. Is it, is it, um, is it always invariably di a distortion that then needs to be corrected? Yeah, I mean, so I think that you know, I'm in awe of anti-lynching activism, and of course I remain in awe of Ida B. Wells and others like her, and I think that um, these spectacles are productive in the sense that they gather people together. So for example, the NAACP and its sort of constant use of lynching throughout um, the early part of the 20th century um, used lynching to drive uh, interest in other causes. It was, so it's a rallying event, something that drove membership, got people to sign up, and then support the cause of voting rights or other things that they wanted, and civil rights that they wanted to do. So yes, I do think spectacles can be productive. The, prop, the thing I wonder about, and I think that this happens in many conflicts around the world, is symbo if symbolically you can sort of represent uh, black oppression with a noose, are women's experiences as universalizable? Like, so that when, what happens to women can stand in for what is happening with a people. And I think that, you know, I think about Crystal Feimster and other people that have written on women and lynching, and today would say her name, and that talks about police violence against women um, and lethal police violence against women, though that's not all they talk about, I think can tend to move towards this idea that what happens to men sort of has to happen to women to bring them into a conversation about oppression. When rape was much more common and the much bigger a pervasive problem in Jim Crow for black women and you know, so what does it mean that it can't, that it's much harder to sort of one, get a very clear universal symbol understood around the world for, for a more pervasive problem. I have a question about um, the bodies of black children in a very particular context. Many years ago when I was a student at the University of Chicago, I was told that there was a practice on the south side in the African American community mm -hmm. that if a woman was on the street with a child, she was out of bounds. No cat calls, no hitting on her, nothing. And as a result, it was very common for women to borrow each other's children whenever <laughs> they would go out in public. Okay. And one of the results of that was that policymakers thought, oh goodness, the black family is all fragmented because kids are sleeping over here and they're being borrowed there and the nuclear family is somehow not working together. Right. I was never able to find out if that practice really did exist. Have you heard of it? Does it exist? Does it still exist? Does it make any sense to you? that it might exist? Uh, yes, so um, strategies for women that women have for avoiding uh, street harassment are you know, from keeping headphones in to wrapping your hair, et cetera. So while I haven't heard of this specific practice, I would not be surprised if it is sort of whatever cover you can take from patriarchy seems, you know. Now, uh, <laughs> uh, that, and then furthermore, from the Moynihan report, that people would see something and then report it as disorder, as blacks stand for disorder in our culture in a certain way, also does not surprise me. Thanks, Shatima. Um, I have a question about the way in which black female bodies have been spectacularized mm. around black male death as mm -hmm. symbols of resistance. Mm -hmm. And so I, thinking in particular of the photo that came out of Missouri of a young woman standing up to a line of, of police officers in riot gear. And so how, I mean, that's another form of spectacularization that mm. is useful and not useful. So I wonder if you could talk about that. Kind of productive, maybe not useful, is the right word. Yeah, I mean, so in, in sort of the politics of death, this role where we understand women as playing the, the role of the mourner, right? So the mom and sort of scolding 
Mike Brown's mom for not mourning correctly or this uh, staging where the police or the DA or whoever trots out the family that then asks for calm in response to the situation. I mean, I, I guess I would say I'm more partial to these images of, so there's the one from the civil rights movement of the, the woman sort of batting the gun away as she's walking around and the image of the woman who sort of has this long flowing dress and she's presenting herself to the police to, look, to get arrested. I mean, that seems to me like I prefer that to the mourning, right? But the emotional and collective labor that women are sort of expected to do and have done in a cause that disproportionately would benefit black men. So both from the Black Lives Matter, so both from Ida B. Wells being the you know, lone anti-lynching activist for, dec for a decade before others came in, to uh, the fact that black li the Black Lives Matter campaign was started by three queer black women, right? And the arguments that it is heterosexual men that people show up for and when the different kinds of things that happen, so the tremendous amount of interpersonal violence to which women of trans women of color are subjected that don't occasion that are both that look a lot like what happens to women, right? It's this death in secret. And then it is the further erasure of not being written about and pretending like it didn't happen in discourse, right? So that all of these things where people kind of can respond and react and understand what happened to a black man as racial oppression and they're much less able to, right? So it becomes both the work that uh, women and the LGBTQI community in the United States are doing that's not reciprocated can become a problem as well. I, I don't know if you want to comment on the fact that what we're talking, what you're talking about, uh, which is the display of uh, 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 dead black bodies uh, that seems to be so obvious to us, so self-evident today, mm -hmm. uh, as only uh, is only four year old or five year old, mm -hmm. and and in fact, uh, although it seems to be spectacular because it's in the street, because it's uh, I uh, in front of everyone, until very recently, it was not at all in the public space or public sphere. And I remember when I uh, was working uh, in France on, uh, on, on, on the police, and I was telling... Well, there it goes. <laughs> Sorry. Papers. <laughs> Papers. That's the advantage of ropes. <laughs> yeah. They don't fly. Uh, so when I was uh, doing uh, uh, my field work uh, on, on the police, uh, and I, I met a friend who was working at the time in Philadelphia, uh, and, uh, and I was telling him that after each death of a young man, mostly from uh, minorities uh, and from housing projects in France, uh, there would be a riot, mm -hmm. local, and in some cases it could even become national riots as in 2005. And he laughed and he said, well, you know, this is not even imaginable in the United States, or if, there, if it were the case, uh, there would be riots every day. <laughs> yeah. and, and of course, uh, and that was uh, th two years uh, before Ferguson. So two year, and at the time, you may, uh, you may have noticed that political scientists and, uh, uh, and, and historians in the United States were writing books about why there's no, no riot. uh, riots <laughs> in the United States after the, uh, 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 in, in the current context while there would be in France, for example, they already did this comparison. Mm -hmm. So there's something that is always uh, uh, remarkable in the fact that some event suddenly becomes, mm -hmm. uh, become uh, 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 spectacular right. and start to make sense, and of course not spontaneously, but yeah. through the work of activists. Uh, so that could be the case also for, for women. I, I think, yeah, I think so. I mean, so for, so for anti-lynching activism, you get the, the development of the technology of photography. And I think for police violence, I would have to say hip hop is one technological advancement that becomes important in, in that. Um, and then social media today, I think. And so the people who were organized around Oscar Grant in, in uh, Oakland and a couple of other things that had happened sort of were ready, I think, for the moment that happened around Trayvon Martin. And I think, you know, social media had really grown up by 2014. And so those groups of people then sort of joined and were ready with uh, direct action. But yeah, so I guess the, 
not unlike sort of all the background organizing that went into the civil rights movement and the Montgomery bus boycott that sort of crystallizes into a thing, but we don't know all the things that have been going on before, but then you're sort of ready to jump on the event. I think that has been important. And again, perhaps with the Me Too campaign, maybe it is at a turning point and maybe we'll see things be, be different. Um, I have one thought about uh, why things became uh, so spectacular, moved out of uh, not being commented upon and then becoming spectacular and being a subject of comment mm -hmm. is um, Obama. I mean, he raised the figure of the black man to <laughs> someone who was intelligent and dignified <laughs> yeah. from, a, from the thug. Right. And so Obama was not a thug. And so Trayvon Martin occurred during his uh, years as president. Mm -hmm. And so it seems to me that he's a clear factor, I mean, I don't know if you agree with me, in the trajectory of pulling it out from the private into the public and making it actually an issue. I mean, he definitely raised something for black people, but I mean, I, maybe it's more important what his presence raised for white people that sort of leads to where we are now, I would think. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the, the great thing about uh, the media and Obama is that they sort of realized that they needed black writers. And so that, you know, <laughs> birthed Ta-Nehisi Coates and others on trying to, you know, black, you know, Black women have to choose between Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama. Will they choose their race or their gender? We don't know what to do. Yeah, those kinds of things. I remember how the press dealt with that. Okay, with these words of hope, uh, <laughs> we, we give the floor to the next uh, group. Thank you very much.